As traditional forms of communication face vulnerabilities such as network congestion, cyber threats, and reliance on centralized infrastructures, individuals and organizations are turning to radio as a reliable alternative. You see, radio offers decentralized, resilient communication channels that can withstand disruptions and provide vital connectivity in times of crisis, whether for emergency preparedness, remote collaboration, or simply just staying connected in an ever-changing world. The resurgence of interest in radio communication underscores the, its enduring relevance and importance in our modern age of uncertainty. To help with this growth of interest, we here at Disaster Communications has decided to take a step back and we want to try to help you with a lot of the newcomers to communications and get a better understanding of how it works. See, I get it. For newcomers in this world of amateur radio, the sheer breadth of frequencies and modes of communication that is available can be overwhelming. With a diverse range of bands spanning from long wave to ultra high frequencies, each offering various propagation characteristics and operational requirements. It's easy to feel lost in a sea of options. Now, additionally, the multitude of communication methods, including Morse code, voice, you have single sideband, FM, uh, throw in digital modes like PSK31, FT8, VARA, and satellite communications further complicates matters for beginners. Understanding the details of antenna system, equipment, licensing requirements, operating procedures, all this adds another layer of complexity. Furthermore, the jargon that we use and the technical terminology can be daunting for those new to the hobby. However, with some patience, guidance from experienced operators and ample resources available through clubs, online communities, and educational material, newcomers can gradually navigate this rich landscape and discover the joys of amateur radio. Embracing the learning curve, like starting with simpler setups and modes, and gradually expanding one's knowledge and skills can help alleviate the initial overwhelm and foster a rewarding journey into the world of amateur radio. video I want to deal with specifically frequencies and some of the different bands and the characteristics that radio operators have available and their use and how how to characteristics differ on each other of those bands. Understanding the breadth of frequencies and their band characteristics is fundamental to learning ham radio. Each frequency band offers a unique propagation properties allowing operators to adapt their communication strategies based on factors such as the time of the day, the ionospheric conditions, and geographical locations. By comprehending these characteristics, CAMs can optimize their transmissions for maximum range, reliability, and efficiency. Secondly, familiarity with different frequency bands enables operators to explore diverse modes of communications, from long distance contacts on HF bands to local repeater networks on VHF and UHF. My main goal is to try to simplify this and help you have a better understanding. I think I have the perfect song and group to help us in this journey. Good Vibrations is a song by the American rock band, The Beach Boys. It was released as a single on October 10th, 1966 and was an immediate critical and commercial hit, topping record charts in several countries including the United States and the United Kingdom. Good Vibrations became widely acclaimed as one of the finest and most important works of the rock era. Now, the vibration the Beach Boys were singing about is not the same one I am, but the music is relatable. So let's use music to get a better understanding of how radio frequencies work. To do this, let's go to the piano. Piano strings, when struck by hammers, produce musical notes through vibration. The pitch of each note is determined by the frequency of these vibrations. In a piano, for example, the strings are divided into different lengths and thicknesses to produce a range of frequencies. Now, these thicker and longer strings produce lower frequencies, creating bass notes, while the thinner and shorter strings produce higher frequencies, creating treble notes. 
The low notes, when played, will create a longer note than a higher string. Now let's draw a parallel between piano strings and radio frequencies. You see radio frequencies, like piano strings, are categorized by their frequencies. Each frequency band, or band of frequencies, so you'll hear the word band a lot, that means a group of frequencies. So each frequency band serves different purposes and has its own unique characteristics. Just as striking a piano string produces vibrations that resonate through the air to create sound, Transmitting a radio frequency generates electromagnetic waves that propagate through space and carry information. In both cases, the range of frequency spans from low to high, allowing for a diverse range of tones, communication capabilities, etc. Similar to how piano strings interact with the piano's soundboard environment to produce different sounds, radio waves interact with antennas and the surrounding environment to propagate and reach their destination. Just as the lower notes ring longer than the high, the same can be said with radio frequencies. The lower the frequency, the further it will travel. Let me now introduce you to the different bands of radio frequencies, and we will relate these to the piano strings. Radio waves are categorized by their frequency, each serving different purpose and propagation in distinct ways. We'll start with the lower, longer frequencies. We'll start with long wave frequencies which typically range from 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz. Long wave signals can travel significant distances by ground wave propagations that hug the curvature of the Earth's surface. This allows for reliable communication over moderate distances, especially during nighttime when the ionospheric reflection is less effective. Because of their long wave radio waves in this frequency range can diffract over obstacles like mountains, ranges, and travel beyond the horizon, following the contour of the Earth. This mode of propagation called ground wave is the main mode in long wave band. Low frequency ground waves can be received up to 1200 miles from the transmitting antenna. Very low frequency waves below 30 kilohertz can be used to communicate at transcontinental distances, but can penetrate salt water to depths of hundreds of feet, and are used with the military to communicate with submerged submarines. Now some popular uses for this band of frequencies include broadcast radio, time signals that can send coded time to radio clocks, submarine communications, amateur radio, low frequency experimental radio, navigational frequencies, for example. I will say here too that the lower the frequency, the longer the antenna. The higher the frequency, the shorter the antenna. So let's just keep that in mind. We're going to work our way up from the long wave all the way up to the top of the spectrum. And just know that the, the antennas will get shorter as we go. Now next, we have medium wave frequencies, ranging from about 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz. Medium wave signals primarily propagate by ground wave during the day traveling a few hundred miles. However, during the nighttime, they can reflect off the ionosphere, uh, which enable much longer distance communication. Medium wave is used mainly for AM radio broadcasting. The spectrum provides about 120 channels with more limited sound quality than FM stations on the FM broadcast band. During the daytime, reception is usually limited to more local stations. Though this is dependent on the signal conditions and quality of radio receiver used. Improved signal propagation at night allows the reception of much longer distances. Uh, signals can have even in a range of like 1200 miles. This is the group of frequencies that you find in the old cars on AM on the radio. Short wave frequencies are the next on our list and they cover a broad range from 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Shortwave signals can travel vast distances via skyway propagation, bouncing off the Earth's ionosphere. This technique is kind of like skipping the signal off of the Earth's ionosphere, and this allows for global communication, making shortwave radio popular for international broadcasting and emergency communication. Radio waves in the shortwave band can be reflected from a layer of electrically charged atoms in the atmosphere called the ionosphere. 
This is called skyway propagation. Thus, shortwave radio can be used for communication over very long distances. Shortwave still remains important in war zones. Broadcasts can be transmitted over thousands of miles from a single transmitter, making it difficult for government authorities to censor them. The following are some conditions that can affect skyway propagation though. The distance from the transmitter to the target receiver. The time of day. During the day, higher frequencies can travel longer distance than lower ones. At night, this is reversed. Also, during the winter months uh, of the northern and southern hemisphere, the AM and medium wave broadcast band tends to be more favorable because of longer hours of darkness. Also, solar flares produce a large increase in D-region ionization. So great sometimes for periods of several minutes that skyway propagation is non-existent. Now, if shortwave had a twin, it would be HF or high frequencies. You see, high frequency bands encompass the range, same range from 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz and is a major part of the shortwave band of frequencies. So communication at these frequencies is often called shortwave radio sometimes. HF signals propagate via a combination of ground wave and skyway propagation, making them suitable for long-range communication, especially in maritime, aviation applications. HF radio is a coveted group of frequencies that amateur radio operators use and rely on during disaster communication is very popular in the day-to-day -day communication as well. Because radio waves in this band can be reflected to Earth by the ionosphere layer, in the atmosphere. This method is known as skip or skyway propagation. These frequencies are suitable for long distance communications across the intercontinental distances and for mountainous trains which prevent line of sight communications. The band is used by international shortwave broadcasting stations, aviation communication, government time stations, the military uses it, weather stations use it, amateur radio, CB radio, maritime sea to shore and ship to ship services uh, over the horizon radar are just among some of the users. Moving up the spectrum, we encounter very high frequency range that cover from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. VHF signals primarily propagate by line of sight meaning they can travel in a straight line and can be blocked by hills and mountains and are best suited for relatively short distant communication, such as FM radio broadcasting, air traffic control, and local emergency services. The military uses it, amateur radio, some of your TV channels, your remote control cars and model aircraft. FM radio uses it, air navigation, marine radio, railroads, wireless microphones, NOAA weather station, all of these use a portion of the VHF band. Next, we have the ultra high frequencies, UHF, spanning from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. UHF signals also propagate by line of sight, but have shorter wavelengths, allowing them to penetrate obstacles better than VHF. UHF radio waves propagate mainly by line of sight. They are blocked by hills and large buildings, although the transmission through building walls is strong enough for indoor reception. UHF is commonly used for applications like mobile phones, satellite communication, and two-way radios. Now we are at the next to the last set of frequencies that fall between 3 gigahertz and 30 gigahertz. This band is called the super high frequencies, SHF, and these frequencies fall within the microwave band. So radio waves with this frequency are called microwaves. The small wavelengths of microwaves allow them to be directional in narrow beams by aperture antennas such as parabolic dishes and horn antennas. So they are used a lot for point-to-point -point communications and data links and for radar. The last group of frequency earns the name extremely high frequency, EHF and its frequencies range from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. Certain frequency ranges near the bottom of the band are being used in uh, network generation of cell phone signals such as 5G network. Scientific research such as radio astronomy and uh, remote sensing uses this band as well as some weapon systems. 
they use this band for their radar found in tanks, aircrafts, and some of the automated guns on naval ships. The TSA also uses this band for security screen. Now, in summary, each radio frequency band has its unique propagation characteristics. From the ground hugging waves of long wave to the global reach of short wave and line of sight transmission of VHF and UHF. Understanding these differences is key to utilizing radio waves effectively for communication. So if you know you're wanting to talk to somebody that's several hundred miles away, you would use one like the HF, and then you would need to know what time of day. If you're going just a hundred miles away, you may want to use like 40 meters on the HF uh, during the daytime. Uh, if you're wanting to talk thousand miles away or 1500 miles, you may want to use 20 meters during the daytime. Now I want to thank you for joining us on this Exploring Radio Frequency Bands. Uh, I want you to stay tuned for more insights into the fascinating world of radio communications. One way you can support this channel is by hitting like and subscribe. We appreciate you. If you have any questions, feel free to put it in the comments below. I'm going to try to keep going on this deep dive and, and trying to simplify this technology for you guys. Thank you so much.